to read. It's Isaiah 65, 13 through 16. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will sing out of the joy of their heart, but you will cry out from the anguish of heart and will wail in the brokenness of spirit. You will leave your name for my chosen ones to use in their curses. The sovereign Lord will put you to death. But to his servants he will give another name. Whoever invokes a blessing in the land will do so by the one true God. Whoever takes an oath in the land will swear by the one true God. For the past trouble will be forgotten and the hidden from my eyes. Romans 9, 25, 26. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. Second Corinthians 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and they and will heal their land. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do sing our praises to you, Lord. We thank you for your word that is everlasting and true. We thank you, Lord, for the relief to the smoke, like Merle said, that you are the giver of all good things, Lord. We just want to remember today who you are and bring praise and glory to you. As we read your word, Lord, just impact it upon our hearts. And Lord, just help us to be obedient to the calling that the Holy Spirit lays upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was thinking about this week, I was looking out at the smoke and everything and the storms going on, and I'm like, I know you're there, God, because I know you're in control and I know you care. And I just praise His name. Because we should be able to praise Him in times of trouble and in times of plenty. If we don't, do we have faith? Do we walk by faith? So when I looked at the... the the smoke out there. I said, well, it's going to be a great sermon for this Sunday to talk about this. And then I got up this morning. I was like, how beautiful it is. Wait a minute. God answers prayer already. <laughs> so you get excited either way. God is in control. He loves you. He cares about you. But He expects you to give back worship to Him. He expects you to be obedient. So I like sci-fi movies. I don't know if you do or not. But I like sci-fi movies where there are these foreign planets and there's life on them. And it's interesting because you go out and there's three moons hovering in the sky and things like that. But you see some of those worlds and there's life on it, but the people have to wear space suits or whatever because they can't breathe the air. They have to stay out of the sunlight or they'd just be a vapor, right? Then night happens. And night could be for years, not for hours. And there are things out there in the night that <laughs> would rather eat you than do anything, right? That, that's, and it gets me thinking... Why don't we live in a world like that? Because God is so good. He loves us. Evolution is so silly. How in the world could this all happen except that God cares for us? He created all these things and the culmination of that was the creating of mankind so that we could enjoy all these things. So even when there is fire or drought or severe rain or wind, God is still there and He still cares. And just like you said, Francine, we need to glorify Him and show one another love so that they see God even in the midst of that turmoil. He's still there. He answers prayer. We've got fresh air this morning, right, Merle? 
So, our God is an awesome God. We've got some more songs that are coming up. Today's going to be a little different than we normally do it. And I don't have any time restraints, so throw your, your phones and watches away. We're going to read Scripture. We're going to study. Paul talks about all Scripture being inspired. He says and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, constru- for instruction in righteousness. What was he talking about? He was talking about the Old Testament. He didn't have the New Testament at that time, right? So we're going to look at the Old Testament day so we can learn from that. We can look at some of Israel's mistakes so that we can apply them to our lives and to this nation. Because we're a blessed nation, blessed by God. But we are walking so far away from Him. It's time for a wake-up call. So this sermon is entitled, Building and Dedicating the Temple. And we'll look at what the temple is in the Old Testament. We'll look at what the temple is in the New Testament. And remember this, God is the one who builds His temples... They are built for His purpose. So don't forget that. So we're going to look at the Old Testament versus the New Testament in the relationship to what temple is. We're going to look at the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. We're going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. So grab your Bibles because we're going to go through it. You can read along. It should be up here, but you should have it in your Bible also. We're going to do a lot of reading of God's Word today. So I'm going to stop and pray again, and we're going to ask God to open your hearts and minds to the words that He has, because they're profitable for you, for instruction, for teaching. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word, that it has passed the test of time, that it is truth. Lord, we thank You for the examples that we have. We thank You that David was a man after Your own heart, even though he did many, many things wrong. But Lord, when he realized that he sinned, he realized that he sinned against you, O God. And he asked for forgiveness and turned from his wicked ways. May we read your word and learn, Father. May we apply it to our lives and may you heal our land when we humbly come before you. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So start in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. When all the work Solomon had done for the temple, or the King James Version says, house... So that's your first indication of what a temple is. Of the Lord was finished. He brought the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of God's temple. I said before that it's God's temple, not our temple. Then Solomon summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the Israelite families to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant. So we need to look at what that is. You may have a good idea of that, but you're going to get a refresher course now. Basically, God made a covenant with His people. He said, I will do this, and you can count on this because God's Word is faithful and true. But it was a conditional covenant. He said, as long as you're doing what I tell you to do and you keep my commands and my covenants, this is what will happen. You will have blessings. You will dwell long in this land. You will have a heritage from the Lord in your children. And he said that these blessings and promises would be passed on to their children and to their children's children. But if you disobey, he said there will be punishment. What good father does not punish his child when they disobey? Because they want them to err back to the ways that are right. So that's why there's discipline. So we're going to learn that from that. God promised to bless as long as they would heed his commands. And he would punish if they did not. So he gave instructions to build a box or ark, the ark of the Lord's covenant. And in that they placed the Ten Commandments as a reminder of the law that they were supposed to keep. The ark was located in the inner sanctuary of the temple in the desert in a tent. But now the nation of Israel had been established. They were under David's rule and David was a man after God's own heart. The nation as a whole was worshiping God. So David said to himself... Hey, I need to build the Lord a temple. (laughs) Who are we, right? So let's go first back to 2 Samuel. Flip there to chapter 7 and let's see what David said. 2 Samuel chapter 7 starting in verse 1. After the king, David at this time, was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet... Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. What a good thought. I need to build God a temple, right? (laughs) But 
I don't build God temples. He gives me the air that I talked about earlier to breathe. He had put the sun, moon, and stars in place for the seasons, for time and so forth. So that I don't have to worry about going out at night and it being years long and I'm ate by critters that I don't even know what ate me. Okay? So God's in control of all things. The ark that we talked about was a sign of God's promise of His covenant. But the important part of the ark was the mercy seat that rested on top. Because that mercy seat, the priest would go in one day a year on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle blood on that seat as a forgiveness of our sins, as appeasing God, a temporary thing. Now remember this, it was only done one day a year in only one place in the world that atonement of sin was made. But see, it's a foreshadowing of something better to come, a new covenant, right? Of Jesus Christ's blood shed once and for all, the Lamb of God shed for everyone who would believe in Him and put their trust in Him. So the, the ark was in the Holy of Holies. That's where the, the uh, priest went once a year and he made atonement for the sins. David was living in a palace. And he said, why in the world, Lord, are you still dwelling in a tent? But see, God doesn't dwell in a tent, does He? And God chooses to come to His people. We can never make our way to God. Don't forget that. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His grace that He saved us. I think sometimes we need a reminder that God is God. We're not. He sits upon His throne. He is the one who has created all these things, and we should worship, honor, and praise Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our body, and all of our soul. So if we read on, we're going to see that David gets a little wake-up call here. Verse 3, Nathan replied to the king, What you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Sounded good to Nathan too. But, there's that word, the complete opposite. It sounded good, but that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant, David. Let me remind you who you are. You're my servant. I created you for my purpose and that purpose is to glorify and honor me so that the world can see who I am. That the nations would know back in the Old Testament day and so the world would know today through Christians. <clears throat> that, this is what the Lord says. Are you one to build me a house to dwell in? <laughs> right? Think about it. <clears throat> now, as we read these next verses, pay close attention to what God is saying and look at all the personal pronouns and stuff for I and my and so forth. God lets him know who he is. Verse 6, I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any one of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built a house of cedar? <laughs> now tell me, Tell, now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Notice that that's added in. Not only is it the Lord, but it's the Lord God Almighty. I took you from the pasture from tending the flock. I, I appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you now. It's nothing that we've done, but by God's grace that these things happen. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And I have, do and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people, Israel. I will also give you rest from all, all your enemies." The Lord declares to you that the Lord Himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish His kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever. I will be His father, and He will be my son. When He does wrong, did you read that part? You might want to underline it. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But, hey, it's good again, my love will never be taken away from him. 
as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from, from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Now if you notice, David's going to have a little change in his attitude in his heart. You see, that's what David did when confronted. He said, Oh God, I have sinned against you and only you. Please forgive me of whatever deeds he had done. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. So in verse 18 it says, Then, after David realized, King David went in and sat before the Lord. King, one of the strongest men in all the world, if not the strongest men, uh, man in the world. But nothing compared to God, and God is the one who put him in that position. He went and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if that were not enough, in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant and this decree. Sovereign Lord is for a mere human. Now if you've noticed, David switched from I to you, right? Giving praise and honor and glory to whom deserved it. <clears throat> and the fact that he was created a mere human to serve God because God willed it, God designed it. What more can David say to you? For now, for you know your servant, sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing, and you made it known to your servant. I imply the you. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is none like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel? The one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for Himself and to make a name for Himself. It's all about God. It's His story. And history tells that. And to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then, as a result of that, people will say, The Lord Almighty is God over Israel. They will see that God is who He says He is. And the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying... I will build a house for you. Get it? It's different than what David thought. I'm going to build God a house. No, I built your house, David. All that you have is because I decided to give it to you. And I gave it to you for a purpose. So you won't be like the rich fool we talked about in Luke. So that you will be rich towards God instead. <clears throat> so your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Verse 28. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing the house of your servant will be blessed forever. So the nation of Israel had been tormented for years. They had been wanderers in the desert. Because of their disobedience, they had wandered. Don't forget that. And now they had been established as a kingdom under David's reign, and they were living as they should live as a whole, as a nation. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me think about back to our history. And you hear things where people say, well, our founding forefathers established one nation under God and stuff. And other people say that that's just a, a hoax, a joke. It wasn't that way at all. But for whatever reason, God has smiled on the United States. But if we don't wake up, where are we at in this picture as a nation, as a people? Just think about it. These blessings that He gave Israel are an everlasting covenant. They haven't fallen out of His grace, and Israel is the nation established again. So we're going to see more and more promises as they come to God, and as His church comes to God, so that we can be joined together forever in heaven when Jesus Christ returns. Wow, what a beautiful picture. And we did nothing to deserve that. In fact, we did the exact opposite, and we deserve wrath from a holy, righteous God. What a miracle 
that God gave us grace, mercy and grace. What a miracle that, that Israel is still established as a nation. That their bloodlines can be traced through their DNA and still to be found pure. That they've hold, held on to the Word of God. And guess what? They're reading some Old Testament Scriptures now and Isaiah and stuff and seeing now, because their mind was blinded because their hearts weren't focused right, that hey... No one fits this description except Jesus Christ, the one that was promised that we crucified instead of accepting. But because of that, God offered salvation to the world. His plan is perfect that all men might come to Him. And we get to be a part of that. But let's get back to the building of the temple, back to Second Chronicles chapter 5. Verse 2, we'll repeat there and again get started. Then Solomon summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and chiefs of, Israel, of the Israelite families, to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant, which we talked about, from Zion, the city of David. And all the Israelites came together to the king at the time of the festival in the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the Levites took up the ark, and they brought up the ark and the tent of meeting and all the sacred furnishings in it. The Levitical priests carried them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not rec be recorded or counted. Now, how, much, how often have you gave that way to God that you couldn't even count it, that you weren't even worried about it? You just gave to God because of who He is. Wow, what a pattern to look at. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put beneath the wings of the cherubim. Now maybe you're not familiar with the cherubim, but they were placed in the Garden of Eden. Satan, Lucifer, was a cherubim. So these are angelic beings of high power and authority. The cherubim, verse 8, spread their wings over the place of the Ark and covered the Ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends extended from the Ark could be seen from in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they are still there today, at the time of this writing. There was nothing in the ark except two tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. Do you catch that part? That they got together, even though they were Methodist, Free Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, they got together and said, we're going to glorify and praise God, because that's what we're here for. They put aside their petty differences and everything, and says, let's just praise the Lord, right? We sang it this morning. All the Levites who were mag magicians, Asaph, Heman, Judathan, and their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. We're going to play guitar today though, right? They were accompanied by 120 priests. What? Okay, get on up. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeteers and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang... He is good, His love endures forever. So let's sing forever, okay? Up. <laughs> you know.
God because He is the one worthy. But we get so caught up in our lives that we kind of forget about that from time to time. Or we take five minutes here or five minutes there. Well, we're going to read on a little bit and see how they worshipped at that time. And it humbles me. I hope that it, it pricks your heart. So back to verse 13. It says, Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. that God responded to their prayers, to their singing, to their worship. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. Now, wouldn't that be great if we couldn't have church because we were singing to God so faithfully, we were worshiping and praying that the presence just came in here and dumbfounded us? Now, we'd be worshiping then, right? For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said, that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have built a magnificent temple for you, a, pla a place for you to dwell forever. While the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them. Then he said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hands has fulfilled what he promised and his mouth to my father David. For he said, Since the day I brought my people out of e Egypt, I have not chosen a city in any tribe of Israel to have a temple built, so that my name might be there. Nor have I chosen anyone to rule over my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem for my name to be there. And I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father, You did well to have it in your heart to build a temple for my name. Nevertheless, you are not the one to build the temple, but your son, your own flesh and blood. He is the one who will build the temple for my name. Isn't that why we're supposed to train up our children? Now Solomon, you can learn from him from his mistakes too because we all have them. But the reason that we train up as our, our children is so they will follow in the ways of the Lord and bring Him glory and honor and praise that He deserves. Verse 10, the Lord has kept the promises He made. He's the one that's forever faithful and true. I have succeeded David... My father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel just as the Lord promised. And I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark in which it is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Now he had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. And it placed in its center, placed it in the center of the outer court. He stood on the platform and then knelt before the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. He said, Lord the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth. There is no God like you in heaven or earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continues wholeheartedly in your way. See, he expects our obedience. That covenant is conditional. That they had to be, do their part. That they had to obey the laws and decrees of the Lord. But see, it was still in God's purpose and plan that even when they didn't, salvation would be offered to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. Even through disobedience, God brings about His glory and honor and praise and draws men to Him. What a wonderful God. Verse 15, you have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it, as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, you shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law. In all they do. As you have done, as David did. And now, Lord, the God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David come true. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? That's just hard to fathom, but He chooses to. We can't come to Him. He comes to us, and we have access to Him. And we'll learn more about that in the temple when we get to the New Testament through Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. Yet, Lord, my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. 
Now notice in these next few verses coming up how many times Solomon says, Hear, Lord. See, Lord. And then we'll see God's response to that. Verse 20 says, May your eyes be open towards this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servants pray towards this place. Hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. When anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath and they come and swear the oath before your altar in the temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty and bringing down on their heads what they have done, and vindicating the innocent by treating them in, according, in accordance with their innocence. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy, because they have sinned against you, don't forget that. We learn in Luke that not all things, not all acts of nature are God's judgment, but there are times when we better wake up and see the writing on the wall that maybe that's what it is. When your people Israel... I've skipped, didn't I not? Okay. What verse was I at? 24. Okay, I didn't skip. When your people Israel have, defeated, have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and give praise to your name, praying and making supplications before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave them and their ancestors. So if God did give this nation to God-fearing people, to Christians, look at what we can do here to retain this land or maybe even come back to this land. But I don't know about you, but I don't want to be driven out of it in the first place. I want to worship God for who He is. I want to learn from His writings because they give me instructions and wisdom. Verse 26, When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain, <laughs> we're in that part now, aren't we? Because your people have sinned against you, maybe, maybe not, but I know I have and I know this nation as a whole have, and I know you have because none are righteous, no, not one. Let's, let's call it for what it is. And when they pray towards this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sins because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servant, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live. See, there is a right way and a wrong way. And sin reign on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Remember these words when we get to, to God's answer. When famine or plagues come to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when enemies besiege them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of their afflictions and pains and spreading out their hands toward the temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and deal with everyone according to all they do. We learn that in Luke, that we're accountable for what we say and do, not what our brother says and does, but us. We're accountable for God. Since you are the one that knows their hearts, for you alone know the human heart, because He created and designed us, right? So that they will fear and walk in obedience to you all the time they live in the land. So, that's a prepositional phrase tying it together, the repercussions of this, what we should learn from this, is that we will fear God and walk in obedience to God all the time that we live and breathe. That we're thankful to God for what we have. We give glory and honor to Him by being obedient. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. Verse 32, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this temple, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. That's our purpose, so that everyone will know and be drawn to Christ. As do your own people Israel, and may, know, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. When your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to, your, to you towards this city, you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name. Then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea, and uphold their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. Isn't that what I said earlier? <laughs> and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemy who takes them captive to a land far away or near. And if they have a change of heart, 
that comes from that change of mind from repentance in the New Testament. In the land where they are held captive and repent. Oh, now we get the Old Testament word, which means more of remorse. And they turn from their directions. Both are intended to bring about a turn to God. And they plead with you, God, in the land of their captivity. And they say to you, we have sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and all soul, God doesn't play games with you. He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. And they do this in the land of their captivity where they were taken. And pray towards the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen, and towards the temple I have built for your name. Then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayers and their pleas and uphold their calls. And forgive your people who sinned against you. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great love promised to, to David, your servant. Now, here's what's really, really amazing. God answers. See, so many times we think He doesn't hear our prayers. He's not concerned. Maybe He's not even there. Maybe Satan gets in and starts deceiving you and says, Why would God care about you? Those are all lies meant to deceive you, to take you from worshiping God. God answers in His own time, in His own will, because He is God. He is sovereign in control. So 2 Chronicles 7. When Sol Solomon finished praying, God responded by sending fire down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground. How many times have you done that? How many times have you said, Lord, you are God, I am nothing. Forgive me of my ways. Turn to Him. And they worshipped Him, and they gave thanks to Him, saying, He is good, His love endures forever. So let's sing another song. Come on, Chuck.
verses. Three verses. <laughs> Verse 4. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered sacrifices of 22,000 heads of cattle and 120,000 sheep of goat. We already had too many to count, right? These we can count. My stars. <laughs> Look at that number. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions, as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising. The Lord in which were used, and he, when he gave thanks, say, His love endures forever. So we're going to sing, I could sing of your love forever. feel like dancing? If you're not, maybe you should humble yourself and say, God, fill me with that energy so that I can have that joy so that the world can see. Starting back at verse 6, opposite the Levites, Levites, the priests blew their trumpets and all the Israelites were standing. Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord and there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the fellowship offerings. Because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat portions. Verse 8, So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him. A vast assembly, people from Lebu Hamath to the Wadi of Egypt. And on the eighth day they held an assembly, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days, and the festival for seven days more. Y'all want to stay here for 14 days celebrating Jesus? That's right. I like to hear the amen. Yes, let's do it. Ready? Yes. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Good thing to look forward to, though. Now, that's praising God, isn't it? And we can come once or twice a week because of our busy lives and schedules. Maybe we have our priorities a little bit mixed up. Maybe our focus isn't where it's supposed to be. We were created and designed by God for His glory, honor, and praise. We rebelled instead of Him snuffing us out or giving us eternal punishment that we deserve. He said, I'm going to send my Son to die for you, to redeem you back, to ransom you. He purchased us back to live a life anew. What an awesome God we have. 
On the 23rd day, verse 10, of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes. Now this isn't 23 days, it's just telling you when it is. <laughs> Joyful and glad in their heart for the good things the Lord had done. They weren't saying, whew, it's finally over. They were still praising God when they went home. For David and Solomon and for his people Israel. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal place and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his palace, the Lord appeared to him in night and said, listen to these answers, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. What's done in the temple? Sacrifices. What does Paul say in Romans 12? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Where does God dwell? Inside of your body, the temple. Are you getting this connection here? Verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, because He's in control of all things, and it might be because He's trying to give us a wake-up call, or He commands locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among My people. Don't forget you're still My people, but He's trying to direct them back to righteousness. If My people who are called by name will, what? Humble themselves. What next? Pray. What next? Seek My face. And what next? Turn from their wicked ways. Four things. Remember them. Write them down. That's what you're supposed to do if you turn from the living, true God and worship someone else. And don't have your heart, mind, body, and soul focused on Him. If you do these things, is He faithful and just and true? Is He forever? Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And I think we're in desperate need of that today. Now my eyes, eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place, in this temple. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, You shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them. See, we don't like to call it that. We like to call it anything and everything except rebellion and sin. But if we're not focused on God and His will and His plans, bringing glory and honor to Him, it's very possible that we might be in an attitude in a position of sin. And we need to repent from that. Verse 20, Then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have consecrated for, name, for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all people. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and His temple? See, they'll even know. When they say, Why is this Christian doing this? Why, why is this? Why is that? They'll know. The people will answer because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who gave them everything, the breath that they breathe, who brought them out of Egypt. They have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why He brought all this disaster on Him. So even when you're not living the life that you're supposed to, God's still going to use it for His glory and honor. But don't you want to be His well, faithful and good servant? Don't you want to look forward to that? Don't you want to be building up rewards in heaven? The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 because of their rejection of the true Messiah, the new atonement. We are under a new covenant now. Remember the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat that we talked about that, that one day a year there was one place on earth that sins could be atoned for. But this was a foreshadowing of something to come. The day that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed for all sin, for all men, once and for all. When death in the grave was defeated, when Satan was rendered powerless because the power of God now comes to reside in this temple. That's what happened when Jesus Christ sacrificed His life and poured out His blood on the mercy seat. If you believe this, truly believe, don't just quote John 3.16, but put your faith and trust in God of sending His Son as atonement for your sins, then you are saved. 
So let's look at the New Testament. Matthew 12, verse 6 says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. These are words written in red. Jesus was telling them He was the promised Messiah to the Israelite nation, but they rejected this new temple that was coming. That we are buried, our old selves are buried with Jesus and raised anew. Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when His disciples came up to Him and called attention to its buildings, to the magnificence of the temple. And He warned them. He said, Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Because this new temple that we're going to continue to see resides right here. God has chosen this as His home. Matthew 26, verse 59 to 61, we read the chief priests... And the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put Him to death. But wasn't that God's plan in the first place? He sent His Son to die. <laughs> Even the evil of men can't snuff out God's plans because His plans are perfect and true. But they did not find anything against Him, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Well, now if you search through Matthew, you're not going to find where he said that because Matthew didn't record it. But John does. In John chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, I will raise it again in three days. Well, maybe he's not talking about his body, right? Well, let's read on. They replied, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple. We just read about all of that and the time that was spent in that. And you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple He had spoken of was His body. It's clear what Jesus is talking about. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 27. We'll read about Jesus' crucifixion starting in verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at Him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked Him. He saved others, they said, but He can't save Himself. He's the King of Israel. Let Him come down from the cross and we will believe in Him, trust in Him, put our faith in Him. Verse 43, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And I didn't make you say this, Merle, so remember that. I'm going to do my best. Eli, Eli, le thani. I don't know, that's close as I can get. Which means I can do this because it's English instead of uh, foreign language Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now they're just fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Because we didn't need that priest coming once a year for a day of atonement anymore. We have access to God through Jesus Christ. He resides with us. Wow. God decides where His temple is, what He's going to do with His temple. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are that temple. Luke records in Acts 17, verses 24 to 28, The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And He is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, just like we read in Samuel and in Chronicles. From one man He made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps 
reach out for Him, and then what? Find Him. Wow. Though He is not far from any of us, for in Him we 